In today's episode, we're going to do a deep dive into the first month of trading in a small account. In just 20 individual days, I grew the account by over $16,000 of profit, 16 times return on my initial deposit. That is phenomenal. Now, I'll be the first to remind you that those results are not typical. I have more than a decade of full-time trading experience under my belt. I do these small account challenges so I can demonstrate to you what it looks like when a seasoned trader puts themselves under the pressure of trading in a tiny account. Because let's face it, trading in a small account is difficult and the first day, the first week, and the first month is probably the hardest. This is part one of a multi-part series where we will analyze each of the phases of a small account from the first month, which we'll discuss today, and then we'll talk about making the first $100,000, then making the first million, and so on and so forth. My name is Ross Cameron, I'm a full-time trader, and let's go ahead and jump in by looking at the first day of this small account challenge. All right, so there it is, $125.70. That's day one, and that's a great result. But I don't wanna focus entirely on the result, I wanna focus on the process. That's equally, if not more important. So what did I need in order to set myself up for success for day one of this small account challenge? What is the basic level of information, your minimal viable product for day one? Now for you, I would encourage day one to be in a simulator, not with real money, because all beginner traders will make mistakes. So you might as well make the mistakes in a safe environment, learn from them before flipping the switch and going live. But in any case, to get yourself ready for day one, what do you need at a minimum? I would say at a minimum, you need some degree of strategy. This is something that so many beginner traders overlook, me included when I was getting started. When I got started, I realized the internet and online trading is incredibly accessible. You can connect on your phone, you can connect on a computer from anywhere in the world, and boop, boop, you can press a couple buttons and you've bought and sold a stock. And just like that, you can be making or losing tens of thousands of dollars. It's incredible. And it's a bit of a rush when you do that the first time and you have your first winner because you will realize, as many of you already have, how quickly you can make money in the market. And that's what's gonna get you hooked. That's what got me hooked. The fact that I could make more in 10 minutes than I could make in any other job probably in the world that I'm qualified for. So for me, to get ready for day one, I need a strategy. I know from my own experience that attacking the market haphazardly, shooting from the hip, doing a little of this, a little of that, buying some NVIDIA, throwing some money on Tesla, that is not a recipe for success. Success comes from traders who have a systematic approach for the stocks they buy, the time of day they trade, where they get in, where they get out. So that's what we need to talk about first because that is your minimal viable level of information that you need for day one. So for me, it begins with the system of knowing which type of stocks to trade. Ultimately, for me, I find that stock selection is one of the best ways that I can mitigate risk. We know that trading is risky. There's no denying that. But it is invariably, inevitably, more risky if you are trading the worst stocks in the market. And then therefore, it's less risky if you're trading the best stocks in the market. But how do we quantify which stocks are good or bad? The answer is going to be different for different traders depending on their strategy. So I'll introduce you to my strategy. You're going to see clearly in this episode that my strategy produces some exceptional results for me. And it does for many of the other traders in the world that are trading this similar strategy. My strategy isn't like just mine. I discovered it through trial and error, but then I realized that there are probably millions of other traders trading pretty much the same way. In total, I would say there are like three different types of strategies that a trader could choose from. The first is momentum trading, and that's the way that I trade. A momentum trader is looking for a stock to buy that is moving up. So essentially, you're looking for this, and a momentum trader is buying on little pullbacks like this and is selling up here. It's called buy high, sell higher. Now, the other strategy, so number one is momentum. Number two is counter trend. So a counter trend trader is going to look for stocks that are going down 
and look to buy them when they curl off the bottom. Or look for stocks that are going up and it's gonna short them coming back down. Now, this is a difficult strategy in my opinion because for a beginner trader, it can be very hard to be able to predict when momentum is going to shift. And in a sense, it's like you're laying down in front of a moving train and hoping it's gonna you know, turn and, and not roll over you. I find it's a lot easier to find something that's already moving with momentum and just to hop on that train for a couple of stops. I may not get from you know the beginning of the move all the way to the very top, but it just feels a lot easier to catch a little bit of momentum and a little bit of profit as something is already moving. Now, the third strategy would be uh, range bound. And a range bound strategy is something that is not going to be realistic for most traders with small accounts because you need to use complex options strategies in order to profit from stocks that are in tight ranges like this. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time covering that because it's just not relevant probably to anyone who's trading in a small account. So when it comes to trading, I am a momentum trader. As a momentum trader or a trend trader, my first objective is to find a stock that has a trend. So as you could see on day one, making $125 is great. And since my account had less than $1,000 in it, $125 is a fantastic return from a percentage basis, right? From that perspective, this is really good. How am I able to grow the account that quickly in just one day? It's because I found an underlying asset, a stock that was moving up 30, 40, 50% in one day. I needed to find something that was moving very quickly. So for my strategy, I focus on volatility. I say that I'm a hunter of volatility and I'm a manager of risk. I need stocks that are moving quickly. I don't profit by buying a stock at $3 and selling it at $3. I profit by buying a stock at three and selling it at 360 for a 20% return. And if I can do that in 15 minutes, I'm gonna be thrilled. Now, some of you might think, Ross, there's no way you're gonna find a you know 20% return in 15 minutes. That doesn't exist. I'll tell you that it does exist. It doesn't exist as far as sort of the mainstream media is concerned because when they're talking about stocks, they're talking about Fet, uh, Meta, Facebook, whatever, Feta, <laughs> call it Feta. Um, they're talking about Google. They're talking about Netflix. They're talking about Tesla, NVIDIA. They're talking about these big, big companies and they don't go up 20% in one day. They never do. But there is a sector of the market where we do see that type of volatility, and those are called small cap stocks. These stocks are lower priced. A lot of them have been beaten up for a long time, and if they have a news headline that is strong, these stocks can bounce off the lows 30, 40, 50, 100% or more in a single day. Now, it's not exactly counter trend trading as a day trading strategy, even though the stock has been selling off, on the day that we're trading it, it has a tremendous amount of momentum. It's moving higher. And I may be buying it up here and selling it up here. I'm not getting in off the low. Something that you will never see me do is just buying stocks that are going lower or just buying stocks in hopes that maybe they will start to turn around. The reason I don't do that is because when I began trading, I had a relatively small account and I couldn't afford to tie up money on a stock that maybe would turn around in a few days, a few weeks, or a few months because that was an opportunity cost. So I kept my account in all cash until I saw a stock that was moving. And then when I saw a stock that was moving, I had the available buying power to move into it, take a decent sized position. If I could capture 15, 20% in one day, I could pop out of that and I would be good for several days. That would be several days of profit for me in one trade. So I only needed to do that a couple times a week and a few times a month in order to hit my goals. It's about quality, not quantity. Now, during my small account challenge, I have traded pretty much every day, but for the most part, I'm only taking two trades a day. There are a couple days I traded more because the market was very strong, but on most days, I'm being very selective about the stocks I'm looking at. I know the type of stock I want to trade. I know the type of pattern, chart pattern that I'm willing to buy. And if I don't see it, I'm not going to take a trade. So one of the other things that's important for me during a small account challenge is the philosophy of building my cushion. I need to build a cushion as quickly as I can. When I've got $1,000 or $500, my account is basically one trade away from blowing it up. One mistake and the account is gone and I have to start over. So I have to take it very seriously when I'm considering pressing the buy button. So when I'm looking for a stock to trade, 
I'm not going to be, you know, willy nilly jumping in this or that. I'm going to be doing my full due diligence and asking myself if this stock really has the potential to make a big move. Okay. So as a momentum trader, we know that that's my strategy. So we'll get rid of these ones. As a momentum trader, what type of stocks, once you know your strategy, the strategy is going to dictate the type of stocks you're going to trade. So the type of stocks that I'm going to trade generally for a momentum-based uh, strategy are stocks that are up at least 10% today. They have to be up at least 10% today because I need something that's volatile. If it's not up at least 10%, it's just not moving enough. Now, here's something really interesting. Once a stock is up 10%, it has a much higher likelihood of going up to 20% and doubling its gain on the day than a stock that is at zero going to 10. So once a stock has picked up sort of that first little bit of momentum, it's so much easier for it to keep going than for a stock that has zero momentum to get started. It's really hard for these stocks to get started, but once they get started, they can move quickly. So the reason these stocks are gonna be up 10% and the reason these stocks are gonna have high, uh, what I call high relative volume today, relative volume, by the way, is a measure of today's volume relative to what's normal for that, uh, that stock. So let's say a stock trades on average of 150,000 shares of volume a day, and then today has 1.5 million shares of volume. If it has 1.5 million shares of volume, that's a relative volume ratio. Well, 10 would be 150,000 to 1.5 million. So 100 would be 150 all the way to uh, 15 million, right? All of a sudden you've got 100 times relative volume. That is huge. Now, why would a stock have 100 times relative volume? It's because it's got news. It's because there's some type of news catalyst. So as a momentum trader, a lot of times I would also characterize myself as a news trader. I trade breaking news. I trade, I'm a volatility trader and volatility comes from news. Now it's true that sometimes we'll have stocks that move higher and they don't have a clear catalyst. That does happen. Uh, just the very fact that the stock started to move higher, traders will be attracted to it. And then that sort of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy where it moves yet again, even higher. But when there is no clear catalyst, short sellers are more inclined to sell into those moves. People who have been holding the stock are more inclined to take profit off the table because there's no real reason for the stock to be up. So it makes sense to take your profit off the table. So for me, I prefer to see that the stock has news. Now, because I'm trading in a small account, I'm going to add some of my own parameters to the momentum strategy. I'm going to focus on stocks under $20 a share. By focusing on stocks under $20 a share, even with a $500, $1,000 account, I could still trade. I could still trade it well enough. Now, when the account is in the first couple of days, I actually put the restriction even tighter. So what I did for the first week is I said, I, I wasn't going to trade anything that was over $10 a share. And I was really focusing on trying to find stocks, but less than $5 a share, like generally as cheap as I could, because then I could buy more shares. So here's the thing with these low price stocks. It's a lot easier for a stock to go from $1 to $2 and be up 100% than it is for a stock to go from 20 to 40. From $20 to $40, that's $20 a share. That's a huge move. That that can happen, but it doesn't happen nearly as often as we see stocks go from a dollar to two. So that lower price range is where we're gonna see bigger percentage moves, and that's what I need to grow my account. So I'm fine with trading a stock that's $3 or $4 or $5, and even one that's six or seven, that's a little higher, I'm, I could work with it, it wouldn't be uncommon to see a stock at seven go from seven to 750 to eight or 850 or nine, two dollars a share. Even if I could only buy a hundred shares, I could still make a hundred to two hundred dollars on that trade. So I can work with that range, but for my focus at the beginning of the small account challenge, I'm going to be looking for stocks under twenty dollars. Now, when it comes to risk management, I know that I need to manage my risk very closely in this challenge. So the way I approach it is number one, I tell myself breakout or bailout. So when I see a stock that meets my criteria, it's up 10%, it's got high relative volume, it's got news, it's also priced under 20. And by the way, I didn't note this, but we'll just add as a, um, 
as, as sort of a bonus here item, and we'll just put it over here. The stock needs to be, oops, obvious. In other words, it should be in the top three uh, percentage gainers on the day. The reason we want to trade stocks that are obvious is because stocks that are obvious are going to be the stocks that pretty much all the momentum traders are focused on. And that means all the volume will be on that stock, which means it has better liquidity. It'll be easier to get in and easier to get out. And the patterns will be respected better. You know, everyone's going to see the obvious green light when you see it on the chart. So that means you're going to get better resolution at that green light. When you see a red light on a chart, everyone's going to see it. You're going to have better resolution on the red light coming back down. So the signals that are very clear on the chart, they, they, they work better when more people see them because more people respond to them by actually buying and selling positions. The problem with the language of the financial markets and reading technical analysis and stock charts is that when you try to apply it to the wrong stock, people are not seeing these buy and sell signals. You're, what you're almost looking at is a chart created by a high frequency trading algorithm. I'll show you an example. Um, I'll just show you, for example, Ford Motor Company. <laughs> Ford Motor Company um, is a stock that is traded by high frequency trading algorithms. And these high frequency trading algorithms, they make the chart almost look like a barcode. This is like, it's, it's just a reflection of a lot of data. It's not actually symbolic or really relevant, to be honest. So if you were looking at this chart and trying to find a pattern, uh, you, you would be making a mistake. There is no pattern here that is created and, and will be seen by retail traders. Re retail traders are smart enough to know that this isn't something you would touch. So high frequency trading algorithms, they exist in the market and that's fine. But the type of stocks that we want to focus on as momentum traders are the ones that are volatile, are obvious, and are moving now. And those are actually going to have a much lower degree of high frequency trading algorithms actively trading them. The reason is because those high frequency trading algorithms do not thrive on high volatility. They thrive in range bound markets where they can buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell at basically the same price and just profit from what's called the spread between the bid and the offer. On stocks that are very volatile, there's just too much risk for those market makers. So they sort of back away and that's where retail traders sort of fill in. So there's more liquidity, in fact, but it's created by retail traders, not by high frequency trading algorithms. OK, so that was an important um, note to add when it comes to stock criteria. So once I find a stock on my scanner that is obvious, that is under 20, then I'm going to be looking at it and I'm looking for a possible position. The scanners that I use are, you can see them right here. Um, this is a top gainers scanner, this window here. This is showing me the top percentage gainers in the entire stock market today. So SGD up 88%, AIMD up 80%. And these have millions and millions and millions of shares of volume. And their relative volume is extremely high, high relative volume. Now the float on both of these stocks is under 10 million shares. One thing that you will notice is that stocks that have lower floats are going to tend to be more volatile. So I'll actually, I'm going to add a couple more lines here. So I'm just going to say, should have news. It needs to be obvious. And float under 10 million shares, preferably. And then my additional filter is um, price under $20. So now we're getting a little bit more detail about the stocks I'm willing to trade. Now, the reason I didn't choose all of these metrics just arbitrarily, these were chosen based on looking at my own metrics. When I look at my own trading performance, it tells me these are the stocks that I make the most money on. So I have that historical data that guides my decisions moving forward. As a beginner trader, if you've never traded before, you don't have your own historical data to base anything on, but you can benefit from using the historical data of other traders, right? So you can use my historical data and gain insights from that. Like, okay, here's someone who's trading. This is what they trade. This is where they make money. So this is a viable strategy. I just need to learn it. Now, whether or not you'll have the aptitude, the skill, and the ability to be profitable with my strategy is another question, but it's always better in my opinion for an aspiring trader 
to start with a proven strategy and to do everything they can to learn the ins and outs of it than to start from zero. Because you, since you have no historical data, you're gonna just start from zero and start testing the water, trial and error. That would, it would be like trying to reinvent the computer starting just with like, you know, a, a box of screwdrivers and like, it just doesn't make sense to do it that way, right? There's a better starting point. Okay, so when I sit down each morning, I'm using this scanner. Now, there are some free scans out there. If you go to warriortrading.com slash day trading, we have a scanner right here that's available. It's on delayed data because um, we can't give away real-time data for free. But this is a delayed data scanner that'll show you the stocks that are currently gapping up and it's updating throughout the, the trading session. So, you know, there are some tools like that that you could use. This is going to show us the same stocks uh, as I see here. The, the only difference is that this is... Uh, in real time, so there's no delay whatsoever. So when I'm actively trading in the market, naturally, I wanna see things that are moving quickly so I don't miss opportunities. So my goal, first, to manage risk on day one of this small account challenge is to find a stock that is in the top three positions right here. It's gotta be in the top three positions. In, in other words, it's one of the top three leading percentage gappers or gainers on the day. And I wanna see that it meets all of my criteria. It's got to be up 10%, have high relative volume, have news, be obvious, have a float of under 10 million shares, and be priced under 20. If check, 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 it meets all of these criteria, then at that point, and only at that point, can I begin dissecting the chart. So I do my first level of due diligence without even looking at a stock chart. I'm just looking at the technical characteristics of the potential stock. Once I have done that first level of uh, analysis. Then from there, I pull up the stock chart. So I could click on the stock, for instance, SGD. I could pull up the stock chart. And I look, the way I do it is I look at the five minute chart first. Sometimes I'll pull up a chart and I'll see that the stock uh, squeeze from like this 50 cents to 250 and is back at $1.50. And I'll think, well, it's, it's really given back most of its move. So eh, it's not really relevant. If I look at it though, and it's still holding up, then the next place I look is at the daily chart. The daily chart is down here, and this is showing the stock's performance over the past, well, this is showing like six months. So this is very helpful for me because this gives me context. And I start marking out my daily chart. What I'm looking for are levels of possible resistance. So I see there could be resistance here at about maybe 232 because of the high of this candle and it came up to about the high of those candles there. So that's a possible area of resistance. Um, going to the left and up, we have this little area here at 514, the high there, we have this high, and then I always like to mark out the all-time highs. So this stock has an all-time high at 1046. That's not that far away when you think about it. And in fact, if it breaks over 514, the next resistance, looking left and up, is at 842. And then the next resistance looking left and up is at 1046. So breaking over 514 would have been really critical for the stock if we wanted to have a chance of getting up to this level. There are times where we'll look at a stock and we'll see, well, geez, you know, there's just a lot of sort of small areas of resistance on this one. And I don't know if any of them are going to be super, super significant, but I look at the high of those candles as being possible areas of resistance. So this stock, well, it seems like it does have some overhead resistance in this area here, which it struggled with. If at some point it gets over that 514 level, though, that's when things could get interesting. One of the other things I also like to do is I like to analyze the position of the 200 moving average. The 200 moving average is right here in purple. This is one of the most respected indicators on the daily chart. And if a stock is below it, it's almost always going to have resistance at it, as you see right here. It comes into it, runs into it. Now, this pulled back and then it broke through it, which is great to see. That's fine. They can break through it. They will always require high volume to break through a critical level like that. Uh, but, it, but when they first are coming up to it, it's going to be upside resistance. So I would never buy a stock right under the 200 knowing that resistance is right there. Uh, I, I don't want to say never, but not, I, I would almost never do something like that. There might be an occasion where there's an incredibly strong news headline, but not likely. So I look at the position of the 200, and then again, I look to the left and I look up. So on this one, uh, you'll notice we came up to this level here, the highest candle, 796. That was resistance on this particular day. 
And this is no, this gives you the ability to further reduce your risk because you can look at these charts and when you see that, oh, I've got resistance here, then you're not going to be the person buying at 796. You're going to be thinking, well, we might have some sell resistance up here. So once you learn this language, the better you get at it, the, the, the more of an edge you will have in your own trading. Again, once it breaks over 796, I had room all the way up to the high here of 1208. Above that level has lots of room up to the high of this candle, which is a ways away, all the way up at $26. So once I've analyzed the daily chart, then I'm looking for my intraday opportunity. I've checked the five minute, it looks okay. I've checked the daily, I'm okay with that. Now I'm looking for an entry and I use the combination of the 10 second chart and the one minute chart. I like using both of them, uh, especially on a fast moving stock because sometimes the one minute uh, can even be too slow when a stock is popping up quickly. This is actually a good example. This stock here on the one minute went from $3.79 to almost $6. One, two, three, four, five green candles in a row and it didn't even look back. So if you were only trading on the one minute chart, there was no entry during that period. But let's look at this on a 10 second chart and let's see if we can find an entry. Now I know I traded this one, so I know that there was an entry. So what I looked for here on this was a momentary pullback. And we got a momentary pullback right here. And we got another one right here, right? See those little red candles? The dip right here and the dip right here. So on the 10 second chart, we actually got micro pullbacks. And that means a 1,000 share position of this at $4.80 could have yielded $1,000 of profit on a position that was only $4,800. That's a 20% return. That's phenomenal. And I made about $2,000 on this trade. So this was a solid trade. Now, it would have been nice if it kept going higher. Some of them will, some of them won't. And that's okay. I'll trade the volatility. I'll trade what's in front of us. We also had uh, another stock that made uh, a pretty nice move here. And this one, sort of similar. It hits our scanners. It's got uh, a nice catalyst. We see this pullback. And we see pull back here, pull back in here. All these pullbacks become buying opportunities. Now, pullbacks are not always buying opportunities, but pullbacks that occur on this type of stock that meets these criteria, my metrics have shown me that statistically they resolve in my favor. So that means once I found the stock, the next step is to look for uh, analyze, analyze the daily and intraday charts. And then we're gonna look to buy uh, pullbacks, dips. I'm gonna do pullbacks, dips, and breakouts. Those are the three individual setups that I'm gonna trade. But again, it all comes back here, number one to stock selection. This is something that I see so many traders do. They'll say, Ross, I see a picture perfect pattern. And I'm like, okay, where, which stock is it on? And they're like, it's on Ford. And I'm like, no, that's not gonna work. It's not gonna work because it's not the right stock to trade. What's, if you were, if you were gonna say, and you were gonna weigh it, what's better, the perfect pattern or the perfect stock? Always gonna be the perfect stock. The perfect stock, may not have a perfect pattern, but it'll go higher. So you learn that the qualifier of whether or not to take a trade is the quality of the stock, not the pattern. Great patterns, they don't resolve when it's not on the right stock. So first and foremost is focusing on the stock. Okay, so day one, I locked up $125 of profit, which was solid. Now on day two, I came in and locked up $187 of profit, two trades on day one, two trades on day two. On day one, one of the trades was a smaller winner and the other trade was a solid one. Sort of similar to day two. Day three, same thing, two trades. Day four, two trades. So here I am, four trades into the small account challenge. My account is up $618.46. This first week, these first days are the most important and they are the most difficult. When it comes to growing a small account, some traders have said, Ross, you know, do you think you'd be able to turn an account from $500 into a million again? And the answer is absolutely. 
it's not a matter of if I could do it. It's only a matter of how long it would take. The hardest part of any small account challenge is the first phase. And the first phase is the first week and the first month. It's building that cushion. Once you make your first fifteen, twenty-five thousand dollars $25,000, it's like you're sailing, you're coasting from that point. Really, that's how it was in my experience. It's that first that first day, those first weeks, because in those first few days, you know, you get one day, one, one really solid day, like we have here, you know, I'm up $125. That's a solid day. Second day up 187, third day, 150, fourth day, another 150. So now my account's gone from, you know, just roughly $600 plus 600. Now I've got 1200 in the account. But remember, the broker now there's there's a million different brokers that you can choose but for my small account challenges i use international brokers because they do not enforce the twenty five thousand dollar pvt rule all right now i'm not going to name the brokers in this episode because the brokers that i choose will vary from time to time and i want to have this episode be available for you guys to enjoy years from now so there will be a link pinned to the top of the comments, pinned to the description. If you click that link, you can download a PDF for my small account strategy. That's going to give you the breakdown of my small account strategy, what we're talking about today in written form. And I'll also share with you the broker that I like using. So the broker that I'm using uh, right now, I fund the account with, well, $600 just for instance, and I get uh, six times leverage. So I get six times leverage, which means I have actually $3,600 of buying power on day one. That means on day one, if I see a stock, you know, let's just say I see a stock priced at $5 a share and I like it, it meets all of my criteria that we already discussed, you know, check, 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 it's perfect. Then I say, all right, I want to buy this and I'm going to buy, I'm going to buy 600 shares. I could buy 600 shares of it. Five times six, that's a $3,000 position, 600 shares. If this thing squeezes up to 550, which would be phenomenal. That's a 10% return. It goes up to 550. Now my 600 shares are worth 3,300. I'm locking up $300 of profit. That's plus 300. In this example here, my account would be up 50% in one day, right? So I want to remind you that leverage is a sword that cuts both ways. Leverage is very risky. So I could also lose half my account in one day. And that's why these first few days, it is so important to me for me to be a sniper. Every, every hit has to connect. I cannot miss. Now, you know, look, I, I have had small account challenges where I have missed in the first few days. And it's, it's tall. I mean, it's happened. But as much as possible, I need to try to connect. And that means I need to be focused on high quality setups. So back to uh, the whiteboard here. So now, three, four days later, I've got 1,200. So 1,200 times six, right? So now I've got $7,200 in buying power. Now, if I see a stock that's priced at $7, I could buy a full 1,000 shares. And if this stock goes up to $8, which we could see it happen, goes up to $8, I'm now making $1,000 of profit, right? And now my account is, again, in this case, almost doubled in one day. So this is literally the way this account grew. If we look at these uh, these days, we're not seeing an equity curve here, but it's $150 a day for one, two, three, four, five days. And then I started to scale up my position size. What happened on day 10? Day 10, I made a conscientious decision that I had crossed over about $1,000, not quite, but was getting close to $1,000 a profit. And I was like, I am now ready to start to increase my share size and take a little more risk because now I have a cushion. So I had two days where I made $250, $280. And then on day four, this was just good luck. I mean, I wouldn't attribute it to anything more than that. It was just, we had a stock that was fantastic and I made 1700 bucks. And then be, usually the way it is with my trading, my hot days are clustered together. Usually my big green days are, are sort of all together. Cause when the market starts to heat up, we're seeing more and more stocks on that top gainer list that are making huge moves. So then next thing you know, it's like trade three, trade four, trade five. And, and all of a sudden the, the winners are stacking up. So that's what happened there on Thursday and Friday. Uh, Monday, we had a market holiday, so the market was closed. Tuesday, boom, we're back. Record green day for the small account challenge so far. 
slowed down a little on Wednesday, but still solid. Uh, Thursday was slow. Friday was a little slower. And then, you know, you can see how it kind of cooled off here for a couple days and then picked back up on Thursday and Friday before having a record-breaking day here on the 30th. Now, this is also very common for me. So if we do a um, uh, an equity curve, you know, 120, 150, 180, 180, then 200, 200, and then 1,700, and then we had 800, and then 2,200, you know, all of a sudden it starts to, well, I ran out of space. So it starts to move fast, and then I had that day where I gave back 5,000. This is very common for me that when the market's hot, I'll be pushing really hard, I'll be really aggressive, I'll be taking a lot of risk, and then I'll catch a big loss. So this is something that used to happen to me more. Uh, I've gotten better at being able to ease off the throttle and and even like on a day where I'm starting to go red, slow down faster. But if you look, how many trades did I take? I only took one trade. See, I only took one trade here. I took one trade on this day. I took one trade on that day. It just was a big loss because I took big share size. So in net, you know, I was still green for that last week of January. I can't really complain but I was naturally disappointed because I was up about 21,000 on the month and then, you know, had to settle for being up uh, 16,000 or something, you know, around there, 16,000 in profit. So let's take this as an opportunity to talk for a moment about trading psychology. I actually have a couple of books here that I think you may find very helpful. One of the biggest challenges of trading in a small account is the pressure. Now, some of you will say, Ross, <laughs> there's no pressure for you. You've made millions of dollars in the market. And I would argue that that's not exactly true. I am doing this challenge in front of an audience of millions of people on YouTube. So there is pressure. I don't want to fail. I want to do well. Now, the pressure is a little different for me, but it's pressure all the same. But what I've gotten good at over the years is managing those emotions. Trade Mindfully is a great book by Dar Gary Dayton where he helps you understand the emotional cycles that so many traders fall into. When you have a state of you get frustrated and then next thing you know, you're revenge trading, you're getting stubborn, which we could probably say on that final day of January, I got a little stubborn by holding that stock until I was down $5,500. I probably should have cut my loss sooner. I got emotional and the effect of getting emotional there, the result was that it made the loss even bigger, right? What likely happened is I took a trade a little impulsively. I got in a little too quickly before doing my full due diligence around risk. I might have liked the stock. It was moving quickly. I had news. And then all of a sudden I'm jumping in it and it flashes down and I'm like, uh-oh, I made a mistake. Deer in the headlights. The moment that happens, my heart starts pounding. You know, my eyes sort of, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm now starting to go into those primitive fight or flight responses. And I'm thinking, all right, this is not good. I'm feeling discomfort. And so I want to alleviate that discomfort. The best way is if this stock goes right back up and I don't have to sell for a loss. So I hold it and I keep hoping that it's going to turn around. And then as it goes lower and lower and lower, I finally capitulate and I give in. Now, the worst thing that could happen would be that a moment after taking this $5,000 loss in the state of anger and frustration, I go and slam the buy button and buy as many shares as I can of another stock. And then I take another $5,000 loss. And then the very worst thing I could do is the second after that, I do it a third time and a fourth time and a fifth time until I have fully spiraled out of control. The book, uh, by the way, this is a this is a classic. This is a really good one. If you haven't checked this out, it's, it's by me, Ross Cameron, How to Day Trade the Plain Truth. Uh, but Thinking in Bets and Quit, these are two books by Annie Duke. She's a professional poker player. She's made millions of dollars. And she talks about spiraling, um, going on tilt, where a player loses their edge by giving in and capitulating to emotions and becomes incredibly reckless. And that same phenomenon happens in trading as well. It can happen. You know, when you make a mistake trading, no one's stopping you from continuing to trade that day except yourself. And that requires a high degree of discipline. So the most successful traders are traders who are, they're, they're, they're smart, they're driven, they have a real aptitude for the markets, but very importantly, they have discipline. 
So this success that I saw here in this first month, the small count challenge, it wouldn't have been possible without the discipline, first of all, to take only two trades most of those days and then walk away. That is, uh, I would say, the power of knowing when to walk away, quit. This is something now, uh, of course, I was doing this um, this challenge before I read this book, but um, but nonetheless, it's it's a great book. And I think that for you as an aspiring trader, you need to be able to know when to walk away. When you get out of a taxi cab, you don't think about where it goes after you get out. You just get out and you go on with your life. And yet when you get out of the market, it's so easy for traders to obsess about where the market went after I got out. Oh, it went higher. I could have, would have, should have held. Oh, it went lower. I perfectly timed the exit. That is measuring your self-worth and your results based purely on the hindsight. Everything in hindsight is clear. But in the moment, you have a certain set of, of information and you have to make the best decision with that. And that's the decision you're going to make when you take a trade each morning, when you're looking at a stock to potentially trade. And it's a decision you make when you think about when to walk away. So for me on day one, when I was up $125, is that a huge winner? No, it's not a huge winner for me. Those are two small base hits. I was actually hoping for a little bit more. Day two, 100 day seven, it was good. If I'm going to be honest, I had a goal of $200 for each of those days. I was hoping that I'd be able to do that. And it didn't happen. But I had to be grateful for what I had, and I had to recognize how easily I could give it back. I knew that what I needed to do each day was consistently lock up a little bit of profit so that the next day, my on day one, you know, 600 times six equals $3,600 in buying power. And then all of a sudden, you know, I'm going up to $750, and then I'm going up to $800, and then I'm going up to $900 and then up to 1000 and suddenly my buying power has you know gone up to $6000 or whatever right so uh, this is what i was what this is what i knew i knew that i needed to make these small incremental steps because each day my buying power would go up a little bit more a little bit more and that would mean that i could buy a few more shares a few more shares a few more shares and if i just kept my head down and focused on those base hit days then eventually you know i would just have the good fortune that there would be a stock that was just terrific and ended up doing far better than I expected. Trading long term is not about luck, but there is a degree of, of, you know, good luck and bad luck that can happen. And as long as you position yourself where you're managing your risk, you're going to minimize your downsides from bad luck. You know, look, you might be in a trade and you lose internet. That's bad luck. You, you can have a backup internet, but still things like that can happen. Or you could be in a trade and all of a sudden the stock just skyrockets and it just goes crazy. And you're like, whoa, that was great. You know, I was in the right place at the right time and I'll take it. I'll be grateful for that. And I got a couple of those during this first month. And that certainly helped me. So the moral of the story is that it's all about base hits. Base hit, base hit, base hit. That's what these metrics reflect. And these metrics also, by the way, reflect accuracy of about, it was over 80%. They reflect a, a terrific profit loss ratio. So my metrics across the board were really solid for this first month. And then the total profit, of course, was really good as well. Again, this all comes back, number one, to the fact that I had a track record going into this small account challenge, which gave me confidence. That confidence is why I was able to pull the trigger on day one with decent size. You know, making $125 on a small account, you do that by basically putting your whole account into one trade. Now, I'm not risking the whole account. I'm not going to let the stock go to zero, but I could lose 20% of the account in one day. Or conversely, I could make grow the account by 20% in one day. And of course, that was the goal. I, I knew that risk going into it. So in order to get yourself to a point where you have that degree of confidence, what do you need? Well, I would say if you're going to be a momentum trader, you need to already know the right stocks to trade. You need to have experience analyzing the daily charts, the intraday charts, and you need to be good at buying these pullbacks, the dips, and the breakouts. And the way you get good at that is by practicing it. You practice in a simulator. Watching episodes like this, what, attending my full-length Warrior Pro curriculum, those are invaluable in your endeavor to learn more about the market. But you have to put in the time of gaining experience. That's how you convert knowledge into skill. Now, for me, it wasn't like that because for me, when I was getting started, 
I'm independent. I, I've never wanted to do kind of, I'm a hands-on learner. I want to figure it out myself. I don't want to follow the instructions. I'm going to do it myself. And I was the same way with the stock market. I said, I'll figure this out myself. And that's kind of, it's kind of ignorant of me to do that, to think that I would be able to compete against people who are, you know, very skilled in these industries, especially these like mathematicians and PhDs that these high frequency trading algorithms hire to compete in the market. So to think that I was going to be able to compete against them was very naive. It took me years of trial and error to develop my own set of historical data to find that these were the types of stocks that I was consistently making money on. The problem for me was that when I was going through that trial and error period, I was trading a little bit of everything. I was trading options. I was swing trading. I was trading penny stocks. I was trading large caps like Apple. You know, I was trying to be a master of, of everything. And I, I was a jack of all trades and a master of none. And that's not a way to be successful as a trader. In fact, if you can be a master at just one strategy with just one setup, that can be enough to keep your head above water. And I'm serious about this because if you focus on just doing 15, 20 cents a day from that strategy, let's say you only get a three trades a week, two are winners, one is a loser. All right, that's fine. You're still making progress. You're keeping your head above water. As long as you manage your risk and you keep your losses smaller than your winners. And that's just the logic that I've always used. I never want my losers to be bigger than my winners. So in terms of profit to loss ratio, they should at the very least be even. And that way, as long as I'm right 50% of the time, I break even. And if I get really good at choosing the strongest stocks, my accuracy is higher and I make money. And that's where I'm at right now. But it takes time to get there. I wouldn't want to see you or any other beginner trader make the same mistake that I made of trying to sort of reinvent the wheel and do like this trial and error phase that can last literally for years before you end up discovering, oh, there's this thing called momentum trading. And wait, millions of people are already doing it? Why didn't someone tell me about this? I'm telling you about it. Hello, we're here. We're telling you about it. You just maybe haven't been listening yet. And listen, I'm not judging because I was the same way. Fiercely independent, wanted to figure it out for myself. But I've realized now that that cost me a lot of uh, money and a lot of time that both were very limited during my learning curve. And I think that's one of the reasons that a lot of traders don't find success. They come into the market, shooting from the hip, taking some trades on their phone, you know, while they're in traffic at a stoplight, and they don't take it seriously. And if you're not going to take it seriously, I don't think you're going to get really good results. So if you want to learn more about the strategy that I use for these small account challenges, you want it in written PDF form, there is a link pinned to the top of the comments, pinned in the description, and there will also be some info about my brokers that I like using, especially for small account challenges. Thank you as always for tuning in. I hope you hit that thumbs up and make sure you subscribe to the channel for more episodes on day trading strategy just like this.